the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm not exactly sure how to read John's Jesus. The Jesus that we have in today's Passion. I wouldn't say he seems resigned to what is about to happen. He almost seems to be going through his fulfillment of who he is. Like a king walking into his coronation. It is not about his humanity or about the pathos of the experience as much as it is about him claiming and living into his full identity, his godliness, his role as the Christ, the Savior. Passover sacrifice. In fact, John even manipulates the calendar uh, of uh, when all these events happened, and they aren't celebrating a Passover feast the day of his arrest because Jesus is the Passover. Jesus is the sacrifice. And it's a beautiful passion, but I miss a good bit of what the other synoptics bring to the table. Jesus says, it is finished. Well, what is finished? I know we get to Easter Day, but I want to know what changed on this day? What changed on Good Friday that can't be undone? How are our lives different? It is finished. But we still look out the door, we turn on the news, and we see people doing horrible things to one another. We see evil still in the world. We still suffer. We still do wrong against one another. What is finished? What happens on this day? Because I do believe on Friday something that made the world shake to its very core, happened. A moment set apart from Easter. In fact, when I talk to the children at school, we celebrate the, the Palm Friday service, uh, and I tell them we're going to stay with that really sad ending. Because sometimes the good news doesn't happen right away. We have to know that God is there during the sad part. When we just need to be held, and we need to know that God is there. But what happened that shook the world to its core, that made the sky turn dark? What happened on this day? I prefer to look again to the synoptics, where Jesus looks at the people who don't know why they're so angry, why they're so threatened, why they're so afraid, why they have sticks in their hands, rocks in their hands. Why they nailed this innocent man to a cross. And he says, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But the Jesus who nailed to a cross shouts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because we can feel that. And we understand that glue between God and that human experience. Also recall what I mentioned last night was one of the things that struck me from Brene Brown's research. That whether you ask a Navy SEAL, an athlete, a CEO, or a person of faith, that no act of courage is absent vulnerability. So I need Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus is staring out at humanity and understanding it and living it. I also have been contemplating throughout the whole of this Lenten experience the cross in a different way. So I've been unsettled by the events, the way that we're caring for one another, violence happening around the world, the disconnect. I've 
seen the cross as that absolute collision between the world that we live in, the human experience, and God's absolutely love-drenched vision for the world. That cross that intersection, that collision between God's deepest dreams for us, God's love, rich, soaked dreams for us, and our human condition. And when those two collide, they're never apart from each other ever again. That shroud has been torn in two, the sky has turned dark, and all of the holy of holies has been opened up. And so those dark moments, those moments of despair, those moments of darkness are never absent the light, the presence of God, both because God lived them and because in that moment, that cataclysmic moment, those two realities collided and can never be pulled apart. God is in all of it. There is light in every dark place. It's been cemented. I mentioned a few months ago that I absolutely fell in love with this book. And before I fell in love with the book, I fell in love with the title of the book. All the light we cannot see. All the light we cannot see. And it's about a, um, a girl uh, who was born blind uh, growing up in Paris uh, during the, the advent of, of the Second World War uh, and uh, his her father would uh, make models. Uh, he worked at the museum as the uh, locksmith, and he would make model, perfect models of all of the roads in Paris so that she could feel with her hands and learn how to see what she couldn't see. And on the other side of the continent, there's a boy growing up in an orphanage with his sister in northern Germany trying to figure out what it means to grow up uh, with all of these reports of, of the rise of Nazism uh, and his escape, his illegal escape, his rebellion, his resistance, was that he was incredibly gifted with radios and he was able to tune in and get beyond the German propaganda to what the rest of the world was, was talking about. And one night, uh, through the, the, the raspy, uh, connection, he hears something. In a French accent, he hears an older man talking about the phenomena of the human brain. Despite the fact that, that all of that matter sits inside fluid that is encapsulated by our skull and has never been exposed to the light, it can create images of the world that are absolutely cascaded in color and light. Images totally absent from the experience of being inside the human brain. It opened him to thinking about things he'd never thought of. In a rather gray place, an industrial part of Germany preparing for the Second World War, he had that image. And the gentleman went on and he talked about, uh, through the radio waves, he talked about a plant who lives on light like we live on food, who soaks up light that's what it does. It brings in light and it stores up light. And then after it dies, it falls into the ground or into the water and it becomes peat and then it becomes uh, a, a soil and then it hardens and hardens until it becomes coal. And he said, you look at that dark piece of coal and it's pure light. It's derived from pure light and when you light it, it provides warmth and light for us. The title comes from all the ways that that is true. And all the ways that those radio waves become part of that light connecting us one to the other. Remember the second thing I mentioned last night that struck me about uh, Brene Brown's findings about the, uh, the human psyche is that uh, our primary need is to belong. And the absolutely crux of that is that spiritual belief that we are connected, bound together by something bigger and greater than ourselves. 
and that that connection, that thing, is good, is compassionate, and is loving. That's John's fundamental belief. That on that cross, Jesus drew all people to himself. It is finished. There will never, ever be a divide between God and God's people, between peoples of the world and God ever again, and between one another. It is finished. And so we'll look at that cross. And we'll see that intersection between our lives, no matter how muddy or dirty or messy they may seem, and that love-soaked dream that God had for all of us, was willing to pour out God's self for. And we'll see light. We'll see little beads of light, cascading like radio waves, connecting people who are supposed to be enemies, filling places that hadn't seen light with the potential and the perspective of light. Coming a place of resistance where those radio waves allow us to stand against places of darkness and shine light and realize that truth that we are indeed bound together by something greater than ourselves. So on that cross, all of that rests. And on this day, before we get to Sunday, on this day, the shroud has been torn open. And God is pregnant in this room as God is pregnant in every human experience. That light cascades into every dark place as we stare deeply at that cross. Allow your mind and your brain and your body and your soul to be filled by that light. Shroud has been torn in two forever. Amen.